Is that thing at the top cropped? That's all right. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the, I uh, think one of the, um, the difficult things that journalism, that industry has had to confront is the apparent uh, uh, unwillingness of the market to support quality journalism. I mean, uh, based on the troubles that you've seen journalism go through, I mean, uh, would you conclude that uh, journalism is a case of uh, a market failure? I actually wouldn't. I actually think that the, that question is a little bit more nuanced because there is, there are, there's the whole set of media companies that are perfectly happy on the market. The market is happy with them. So those that you know, write to you about celebrities and you have huge circulations and are in yellow color, they're perfectly happy on the market. The market exists for them and you know, it's love we should not interfere with. Now the problem is that aside from those media companies we are not interested in, in terms of their public service, right? Providing some kind of a knowledge and, and uh, um, knowledge for community. Now, if we consider that as one marketplace, you know, everything works well. Now, what is the problem over here is that we have to have, in addition to that one, at least two more. So on the opposite side of that spectrum would be um, some kind of a marketplace that provides funding for media that will never be self-sustainable, financially self-sustainable. And good examples for that would be you know, minority media in most of the countries, um, media for kids, uh, anything that is really educational, that, you know, that the state has interest for people to you know, be educated. So then they subsidize that stuff. So the big foundations in the West being big players on that market. So that is a kind of second market. It does not work great. It's not very efficient. There it has its weaknesses, but you know, the idea that those projects apply for grants and you know, there is somebody who is supplying those grants, being big foundations, or the government in its different forms, development agencies, is there and I think in the next two to three years it will be reformed. There will be, that will be in place. And now there is this third market, which I think is the most important. And when we talk about serious, socially relevant media, that is where that media should be. They cannot be on this market where, you know, returns are 25% a year. They can not, they also should not be, media being business, subsidized completely, because that creates a little bit of laziness, business laziness. So um, there should be a third market in which long-term investors who are interested in both financial returns and social returns should be on one side, meeting media companies that are dedicated to providing public service to their communities on the other side. Now, that is what Indie Voices is trying to be. We are trying to kind of make the community of investors of that type, that are both individuals, and for now we have individuals, but also foundations, also some kind of, you know, units or, or, or groups of investors that are now fashionably called uh, impact investors. So that kind of impact market for media would be, I think, who is actually the most needed part in media industry at this moment. Uh, you've seen over the last 25 years, uh, I think many uh, media ventures uh, come and go, right? a lot of good intentions. Um, some of them maybe undeservedly uh, you know, meeting a premature death. Um, what do you think, uh, I mean, of course, if, if maybe the, if the uh, publishers or uh, journalists don't know what they're doing, they deserve to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to go extinct. But uh, I'm sure you would have seen uh, sort of worthy projects that, uh, uh, that prematurely uh, died. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the uh, less obvious pitfalls that um, uh, media entrepreneurs, uh, editors, producers um, find themselves trapped by? Are there some common weaknesses that you've found? Yeah, I think that there is, you know, they you know that's the same question can be looked at from, from two different opposite sides. Because I think that there is one reason for, for projects to be both successful and not successful. And both success and failure have different faces and different appearance. But basically the core of that is twofold. One is 
do you think that you know what your audience wants and if you feel that you can just give it to them you're absolutely guaranteed to fail so as long as you have that legacy thinking that you know you know i know who is my audience and i know what they need you're absolutely yeah it's just a matter of time when you will fail and i have a great example for that it, it's from the countries of former yugoslavia it's from croatia it was probably by by far the best publication in that region you know really by far and they were absolutely brilliant as long as they had the sense of what really their audience wants uh, but then there's this you know arrogance in which you know when we started working with them i said you know do you know who your audience is they said oh yeah sure it's like this young types 22 to 42 high you know purchasing power that is what we are selling to our advertisers okay I said yeah how about we do um, audience research oh no no we don't want to waste money on that okay then what if we paid for that audience research so we paid for that audience research it actually turns out that their audience is 65 or older they were then also their audience is mostly female which they had no idea that is the case and you know all of those they were actually working or making um, um, publication for totally audience that was not there eventually they they failed and had to go bankrupt although it was the, by far the best publication in terms of quality of journalism so that is one thing and the second thing i think is you know the, the flip side of that coin is you know i think that media industry these days is becoming as fast as fashion industry you know, things are changing so fast you know, the way new storytelling techniques and you know what do you do and where do you find your audience and how things are you know how audience is changing itself by becoming technologically more educated so you literally have to be Zara to be you know to, to be successful and if you in your thinking if you get frozen you're thinking for a year you know, you're absolutely guaranteed to get trouble so I would say uh, being very nimble and uh, aware of fashion you know movements that are happening which is one and second is ability to engage audience ability to bring them in not talk to them but just get them in and you know get them engaged with you um, the, the point about uh, changing fashions that applies more to the the uh, internet media right would or would you say the same thing applies to uh, print radio i think that mostly on internet but look it's the same thing is in print media right we used to have one page or two pages of letters to the editor and now every journalist has to leave uh, leave an email address and you know get audience comments and you know reply to them and have you know, the most successful media like financial times will organize that their audience talks to and it gets it gets engaged in dialogue with their most prominent journalists so even in that uh, in that you know what I would call like small uh, slow moving you know newspaper business things are moving and, and changing very fast the you know the websites are extension of what they publish um, you see New York Times and this what I think is really a brilliant transition from you know slow moving newspaper into something very digital over maybe what year and a half two years a very intelligent move and we all criticized it but they did a great and I think it's a good example to watch how that change is happening it somebody who is aware of that change and how to how to ride on that change in your experience looking at different organizations um, are there uh, better ways to manage that change I mean the I suppose that the intimidating thing for for a journalist uh, looking at these uh, necessary responses is that you know you you feel you have to become an expert in everything right not only get your journalism right but also be a manager be a uh, you know a technology expert and so on uh, how, how, how does one um, manage these different uh, at an organizational level how do you how do you get that formula right you know I have to say that we spend enormous amount of time trying to figure out you know some kind of a formula that will indicate to us who is more willing or capable for a change or not and we couldn't find any rule and I think that it is all in our heads so I know 
brilliant 70 year olds who are willing and capable of change and who are you know charging change in their countries when they're 70 uh, I know some incredibly conservative 20 year olds who you know you would you can't talk to because they are set in their ways in the other way around I don't think that you know either age or you know technology knowing technology helps a little bit but again you know those things are kind of go go together so uh, the only rule I know is when you sit and start talking to a person you can say is that person brilliant you know in initiating change understanding the need of need for it or just incredibly conservative dinosaur that's three years from now gonna die you can't tell <laughs> in advance yeah. You can't. I think it's in a mindset. I think it's at the way. I've also seen some people who were saying, you know, what is that internet? To four years later, be the first to start, you know, um, news portal in the middle of Russia, you know, selling stuff and you know, organizing events, you know, in literally in the in the middle of nowhere. So you know, we are capable of. Every one of us is capable of everything. We just need to make that move in our minds and decide that we want to do it. The um, another sort of uh, uh, troubling thing for for journalists uh, who've been brought up in the more traditional uh, newsrooms is this uh, idea of um, that this uh, eroding firewall. Right? I mean, in the past, uh, journalists had the luxury of focusing on the journalism, and then you leave the uh, marketing, business side, etc. To uh, to colleagues in totally different departments, often people you don't even know and don't want to know, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in, in smaller uh, media organizations, of course, that seems to be much harder. That it seems as if uh, now the modern editor actually needs to understand the business as well. Right? Um, uh, would you agree with that? And, and if so, um, uh, how do you ensure that uh, business considerations don't uh, overwhelm uh, the, the notion of uh, professional editorial integrity. Yeah, it's. I think it's a crucial question these these days, and I think that it is. Um, you know, in old days it was very simple. It was binary code, right? You know, it's a group of people who wear suits, have long lunch meetings and drinks after that. They sign some contracts and bring money, and there's us in the newsroom who actually create everything. And you know, we hate those guys. Those guys do not like us, and but you know, we don't mingle. And that was an easy part. I think that now it's very complicated. I think that that time is past. I think that now the only way to save the companies is if both sides understand what the core values of the company are. There are no firewalls you know, in existence anymore. We can't keep them. We can't afford to keep them. So I think that the both sides have to understand what are the core values, what is it that they're protecting, and what is it that they are working for. Having said that, I find it incredibly troubling what this whole movement of native advertising, or however you you call, or however you, you know, whatever name you put on this process of actually selling your audience, you know, deceiving your audience that you know they think that they are reading something prepared by newsroom, but it's actually they are reading something prepared by marketing, you know, departments of of uh, uh, big advertisers. I think that that is betrayal of serious journalism and uh, if I were in charge of those, I know this is very unpopular, but I think if I were in charge of those media companies that are getting engaged in those practices, I would probably resign rather than, you know, engage in something that is, I think literally goes against every, every principle of serious and, and public service journalism. Could you elaborate on what those uh, principles are? And uh, I guess this this goes back to your what you call your, your third market, your third marketplace. Yeah. I mean, what is it? What are the stakes? Right? What are the stakes here? Uh, why is it so important to uh, to preserve those values? Number one, and to preserve uh, and to develop um, institutional mechanisms, funding mechanisms to ensure that those values are in fact. Uh, um, enshrined in you know real media real products well i i you know for me it's self-evident you know you want to know who pays your doctor right and if it's not you who is paying it 
and if it's some kind of pharmaceutical company, you would naturally be a little bit suspicious about the medication he gives you. And I would say it's the same thing for you know, media. If they tell you do this or suggest you do that, and you know they pay or that text that is telling you what to do is done by a marketing uh, department of that specific company, I personally would not trust it. So I think that the core values should be enshrined in every newsroom and that those core values should be under no circumstances you should deceive your audience. You have to come out clean who pays for what bills, you have to come out clean you know how the finances flow, where do they come in, who pays for it. Um, and that brings me again you know to this issue of business model, right? The, the business model and I have to say you know media is a, media managers who are running those companies are not the only guilty party over there, right? We all, as audience, would like to have all the news for free, never pay anybody anything, and then at the same time not to be deceived, you know, and not to, we don't tolerate advertising, we don't want marketing departments to tell us, you know, stories about their products, we don't want to pay anything. Well, that's simply not possible. And I think that the, the idea of that is simply not possible is now starting to a kind of dawn on some of the audience. And they understand that if you do not pay, then your eyeballs are being sold. It's very simple. Uh, I just don't think that uh, if somebody is selling those eyeballs, they should do it in a way that you are not aware of that. I think that they should say, you know, clearly I can see uh, advantage of 20th century Fox company telling me about that latest movie that they made and you know I know that they will put as long as I see a huge headline that it is done by them I see an advantage of reading something about you know how do they see their movie but I would see a big problem in you know reading an article about you know, public health uh, done by marketing department of big pharma company let me go back, uh, this is the last question I guess, but can I ask you to go back to a point that you um, made at the beginning about, uh, you know, that uh, you likened um, the newsroom to, um, you know, our attitude to, uh, to, to welfare, right? that, that uh, we have an insatiable appetite <laughs> to, yeah. to, to make use of whatever money you throw at us. Right? Um, can I ask you to repeat that point for, for the camera, but also to uh, then go on to talk about what what are reasonable uh, cuts do you, th you think newsrooms uh, should make? Right? I mean, at, at some point, cost cutting may eat into your capacity to do responsible journalism. But how do you distinguish between uh, cost cutting that makes you fitter? and cost-cutting that actually erodes your, your values, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in all my 15, 16 years of, probably even more, of investing in media, I am yet to meet a media company that cannot spend all the money on, you know, improving and increasing their news-producing, you know, operations. So, in the newsroom, we can always use more money, we can always use better technology, we can always throw more people on better stories. Now, making connection between that and financially sustainable company, it's it's big challenge. And we spent the last 10 years probably in media industry trying to do it in what I think is the wrong way. So we try to kind of reinvent newsroom and we try to make one guy do a story for a newspaper and TV and radio and you know whatever and blog and all of that in 11 minutes and then six times that much you know in eight hours and which I don't think it's possible. I think that the key issue here is a business model and the business model actually comes as a result of the ownership structure. So here's we we try to reinvent the newsroom. We try to invent everything that exists in media but we didn't touch media ownership media ownership is the only thing in media that did not change since 19 uh, 1870s right when the big families started getting you know involved in there that is their public service they endowed big newspaper and that's it um, i think that 
this digital time requires new digital uh, uh, ownership. I think that over time it will resemble very much what uh, what is I, I try to call that fractional ownership. I think that each media company has its own core audience that has interest in that media uh, uh, existing. So if you and I and 5,000 other people are interested in foreign policy in place of I don't know, Singapore in the world of foreign policy, we may actually put $1,000 each, create initial capital and be the owners of that magazine because we are interested in that thing. And then we, as the owners, the shareholders, actually hire a general manager and tell him, we are only interested in returns of 5%. Don't come back with 30. So everything above five, please feel free to spend. But we also not, there's no way that we can put more money. So you have to make those. In between zero and five, is that your financial goal? If you have that financial goal, if the newsroom knows that, which is, you know, you as a journalist should feel great working for a company that wants only 5% return. Then, you know, both sides have to become reasonable and, you know, find a way for, you know, for some kind of a financial sustainability of that company. So that is why, I, that is how I see this <clears throat> cost cutting and, you know, right sizing, as they say. You know, it's not like you can't be, as I say, you know, we can always have 75 offices all over the world that it's better than having 25. So in that system you propose journalists would still have the incentive um, to not overspend and in fact to, to find creative ways to generate more revenue because that will actually feed back into the newsroom operation. Absolutely. So I think the journalists have no problem working in a company that is making a little bit of money or making a lot of money. Uh, making a promise that most of that money will be reinvested in the in the operations, right? I, I think that every journalist would feel bad making somebody else rich while pretending to provide you know, public service for, for their community. So, and that is why I think that this idea of fractional ownership in which those journalists would be shareholders and their core audience would be shareholders. And you know, it's not like a bad guy with two, three piece suits that are, you know, not they don't have enough money. It's actually us, shareholders, who can all come into one room, thousand people, and you know we have best interest of that company there. We own it, and the circle is then closed. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes,